state against blacks. The author, obscure economist, said poverty programs destroy the natural mechanisms that have always allowed poor people to lift themselves out of poverty. Public TV then ran a program based on the book called Good Intentions. a time of incredible optimism for black people. The civil rights movement was about to achieve its greatest triumphs. Federal and state governments poured immense energy and well over a trillion dollars into the task of relieving poverty and promoting equality. The result, a complete failure. For many blacks at the lower end of the economic spectrum, the future looks more hopeless today than it did 20 years ago. More hopeless today after trillions of your dollars in poverty programs? How can that be? Well, let's ask the man who said it 25 years ago, economist Walter Williams at George Mason University. So, for the people at the bottom, it's just natural to assume that a handout would help lift them up. Well, that's, that's, that's a nice assumption to make, but it didn't turn out that way. There's a huge segment of the black population for whom uh, uh, upward mobility uh, is elusive. And, and I believe it's elusive because of the welfare state. It's because of government. Because of the help, meant for them. And you have written a new book uh, that touches on this, titled Race and Economics. Mm -hmm. And one of the points you make in this book is that the minimum wage, which overwhelmingly Americans support, mm -hmm. you say hurts people. Yes, and, and if you, well, look, let's not look at the intentions behind the minimum wage clause, but most, for the most part, the intentions, at least in the United States, are very good. But we have to ask, what are the effects of the minimum wage? And you find out the effects of the minimum wage if you put yourself in the place of an employer, and you must pay $7.25 no matter whom you hire. Will that employer pay, pay that amount and hire a person who, makes, uh, who, who can only add 3 or $4 worth of value per hour? That is, the minimum wage discriminates against the employment of low-skilled people. So fewer of them get hired. That is absolutely right. And to get their feet on the bottom rung of the economic ladder, be employed, and perhaps then move up. And yet when I talk to people about this, normal people, not economists, almost everyone says a living wage is essential. I think the minimum wage is necessary just to keep from exploiting workers. Of course. Why? Because people need money these days. People always need money. And 25 years ago, Walter Williams' documentary featured shop owners like this man, who said he hires fewer people because of the minimum wage. I wish I could give more kids a job because I have kids constantly coming up to me asking me for jobs. You know, and I can't give them the jobs that I, that I wish I could give them. If there were a uh, lower minimum wage, I could hire maybe two or three more. I used to work in a store like this. I broke out of the North Philadelphia ghetto nearly 30 years ago, and so did most of my friends. My whole crowd worked. Back in those days, just about any kid who looked for a job could find one. Today, in ghettos like I grew up in, 70% of black children who look for jobs cannot find them. And today, that number is still about the same, and the disparity between whites and blacks, white males, teenagers, 16 to 19, 27% unemployment, black males, same age, almost twice as many, more than half, 52%. Why would there be a racial difference? Well, I mean, the minimum wage... Well, you'd think would hurt all teenagers. Well, as I said, the minimum wage tends to discriminate against low-skilled people. So, young people in general, they're low-skilled because they lack maturity and experience of adults. But, black young people not only share those handicaps in general, but many of them get a fraudulent, fraudulent education in the public school system. So, if there's a law that discriminates against low-skilled people, it's going to have a doubly negative eff effect on black teenagers. And by the way, John, at one time in the 40s, black teenage unemployment was less than white teenage unemployment. And today it is some multiple of it. And it's changed because of the welfare state? It's changed because of the minimum wage law. That is, the minimum wage law rose, got higher and higher and higher, and employers uh, discriminated and discriminated more in terms of low, hiring low-skilled workers. And yet, 83% of Americans, according to a Pew survey, support raising the minimum wage. I think people have the misguided notion 
that the minimum wage is an anti-poverty tool. But that doesn't even pass the smell test because if the minimum wage law could eliminate poverty, you just go to Bangladesh, you go to Ethiopia, you go to Haiti and say, raise the minimum wage there and we'll, you'll get rid of poverty. No, people are poor because, for the most part, they have low skills. If you could do it with the minimum wage, why 725? It's sort of cheap. We should raise it to 20 bucks an hour. Or, or 50. <laughs> um, economists understand this. A survey of the American Economic Association found 90% of economists say minimum wage increases unemployment. And you've called it a great tool of racism. Yeah, yeah. And matter of fact, some years ago, I wrote a book called South Africa's War Against Capitalism. And I did a study, study of labor markets in South Africa. And white racist unions in South Africa that would never have a black as a member were the major supporters of minimum wage laws for blacks. And their stated purpose was to protect white workers from having to compete with low-skilled, low-wage black workers. Let's now talk about welfare. <clears throat> Again, when I talk to people in the street, most everyone said there ought to be government handouts for needy people. People need the help? Yes, of course, especially in this economy. But 25 years ago, Walter Williams pointed out, government handouts encourage people not to try. They may never learn to pull themselves out of poverty one step at a time. Like some giant drug pusher, their government has lured them into dependency on a system that will maintain them in permanent poverty. In every respect, welfare has backfired. Government's like a giant drug pusher? Oh, that's absolutely right. The welfare state has done to black Americans what slavery could not have done, the harshest Jim Crow laws and racism could not have done, namely, break up the black family. That is, today, uh, just slightly over 30% of black kids live in two-parent families. Historically, from 1870s on up to around the 1940s, and depending on the city, 75 to 90% of black kids live in two-parent families. Illegitimacy rate is 70% among blacks, where that is unprecedented in our history. Now, it's not just a matter of a racial thing. In Sweden, it is the mother of the welfare state and illegitimacy in Sweden is 54%. And why does a welfare state create illegitimacy? Well, because, look, if you, if you subsidize anything, you're going to get surpluses of it, and if you tax something, you're going to get less of it. If you did not get welfare, then people would decide, I'm going to go out and get a job. I'm going to live more responsibly. I'm going to get married before I have children. <laughs> so that's right. Yeah. But you're, the welfare state actually discouraged some men from marrying the woman. Oh, yes. So they would lose the check. That's right. The government has said to, to many young women, I am the father. Yeah. And so the father, black males, have become dispensable. Black Illegitimacy in the, was 19% in 1940, but it skyrocketed during the Great Society, and now it's over 70%. Yeah, it's over, and, and that's a heck of a start in life. That is, where you, to be born, you don't know who or where your father is. That's not really a great start in life. All right, let's move on to licensing laws. Now, again, this is something that people tend to like, and outside the studio, just out there are 10,000 yellow taxis. And it's intuitive to think that government should license those cabs, make sure they're safe, make sure the drivers are competent, limit the number of them so you don't have chaos out there. And they do license taxis here in New York. They license them to death. You can't just buy a cab and start picking up passengers. You have to buy a license from another cab company, and that now costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Regulation itself is priced poor people out of the taxi business. And again, Dr. Williams saw that years ago. I drove a cab back in 1957 for a while. I made about $125 a week. The drivers in Philly now tell me they make about $250 a week. They could make much more if they owned their own cabs. But what stops them? It's the thousands of federal and state regulations that are imposed on the U.S. economy. Sometimes, getting a license requires a friend in the business. All those licensing laws do just one thing, keep outsiders out. I mean, I can see when a medallion in New York now costs $600,000, it keeps poor people out, but are you saying just have no licensing, let anybody hang out a shingle, just 
go by, offer to pick people up. That well, frightens me. Well, well, compare New York City, uh, where a licensed owner, not ready.